Well, thank you, and good evening. Um, I really appreciate you allowing me to share my story with you today. Um, I always go back to this moment when I was working with a chef, a great chef named Charlie Trotter. And he gave me a valuable lesson in life that allows me to be here today. And he said, make it happen. He said, make it happen with what you have. What he did was he gave me a simple kitchen lesson that gave me the wherewithal to go through a long journey with an impossible task, which was considered impossible, and, and be here. So my world is blessed each day with the satisfaction as a restaurateur and, and community leader. But not a day goes by that I forget that moment years ago when as a young man with reckless energy, with a single mother doing her best, that her simple home was surrounded by U.S. Marshals who were looking for and found me. They plucked me out of my home and I set in a brief but unforgettable journey that allows me to stand in front of you today with dignity and pride. Two things I never thought I'd be saying to anyone after that moment. My goal today is I hope my story inspires you. I hope it inspires you to make it happen with what you have. I hope this mic works on both sides next time too. <laughs> <laughs> in the meanwhile, I really hope it does. I hope that this journey allows you to see that no matter who you are or where you come from, that you can do it. Those of you in the crowd, I hope that you don't sell yourself short in saying that, hey, with my talent and my treasures, I can complete someone's dream as well. And one thing about Edwin's, when you fight hard together, nothing is impossible. And I mean nothing. So I go back to that moment, standing in front of that judge. You know, my fate hanging in between that, that space between the man in robes and me. And, and what I remember most about that day is that feeling of being helpless. I remember that feeling of that judge having every power in his hand to do what he wished with me. I was a cold lump on his plate. But what he decided to do was give me a second chance. He said I had more to offer. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that moment of having that second chance. My road quickly led to a restaurant in downtown Detroit and under a chef named George. And what he decided I needed was a skill. He decided what I needed was a skill and some sort of direction in my life. And I'll never forget what George did for me. He was a mentor. He watched over me. He embraced me. And he taught me. Many of you in this room had a mentor. And if you can picture that, him or her, that was George with pudgier hands, though. He was a big Greek chef. I mean, he had an enormous fist. And what I always remember him as he cut. So George did more than nourish me with the art of culinary and, and the business of hospitality. He also inspired me with the knowledge that honing a young person with a skill, especially a young person on the wrong path, was the greatest thing that you could do. He gave me the direction. He told me that it wasn't practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. And that lesson allowed me to go all over the world and work. He gave me the recipe for success. So I committed myself to this craft. I took it and ran. I was the first person to go away to college with my family out of state. I went to the Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park, New York. Immediately when I was there, I noticed that, hey, I wasn't just some follower, some straggler, or chopped liver. I was someone who was a leader, and I was contributing right away. George taught me the lessons that it took to make it in this business. And from there, I said, the sky's the limit. So I applied for Charlie Trotter in Chicago, and he said, I'll take you. And then he ran me almost into the ground, but I got back up. And then I said, well, this is, that was fun. I, I'd like to take a little bit more pain. So I said, let's go to France. So I hopped a flight to France without ever speaking the language, knocking on a chef's door, and he employed me. I worked hard enough, learned the language quick enough to work my way up to Paris to a Michelin three-star restaurant. From there, it was Manhattan to the finest. And in 2004, I said, damn it, what I have here is too good. I'm on borrowed time. And for me, it should have been 10 years behind bars, not just a year's probation. I'm on borrowed time and I'm gonna keep pushing it, and I'm gonna give that lesson that George gave to me and build it. So in 2004, I returned to the Culinary Institute of America and wrote the business plan for what you see today, Edwin's. So that 10 years in the wilderness was a long time. It doesn't happen overnight, and that's always my advice to anyone starting up a new social venture, is that it takes time, and those lessons along the way, that wilderness is where you're really gonna find the core of what you do and how you do it. So, why Cleveland? It had the worst graduation rate in 1998 for public schools. That's when I graduated high school, that's when I found George. So I figured there's a lot of me's that didn't meet George's. So, Cleveland it was. In 2009, moved here to Cleveland, started opening up a restaurant called Albatross, 
and had a blast doing it, but I couldn't turn my, my, my head to this astonishing fact of Cleveland and this, this problem that we have with reentry. You see, we have 5% of the world's population, 5%, yet we hold 25% of the prison population in the world. Those numbers don't add up. We have 2.3 million people behind bars right now, around 51,000 in the state of Ohio. And if you take the whole justice system, you're looking at about 6 million. In Ohio, one in six individuals have been touched by the justice system. And it's not cheap. As a nation, $74 billion we spend to do it. That's six times more on higher education. So we're out of whack, plain and simple. We don't have it together. And the most astonishing fact is, 43% in this United States will return to prison after three years, or within three years. So this recycling of humans doesn't jive. And that was the inspiration for Edwin's. This is how we began. And though the problem seems big, that mountain seems high, the number is outstanding, outrageous, outrageous. There's something sweet in all this. There was something very sweet that I found in this climb up the mountain. And that's you. It's our community. You see, our community has risen up to fight. It's the Matt Fieldmans in the crowd who said, let's connect the dots. It's organizations like SVP who said, hey, let's help build some infrastructure. It's businesses out there, our community business, like Jones Day and Bialoski, and said, hey, this one's on us, we got it. It's the foundations that say, take this, do good. It's everyone that you're probably seated next to, if not yourself, that helped make Edwin's what it is today. It was even once a seven-year-old child who gave us $1.72 of our allowance. That's heroic. Everyone gave outside their means to make Edwin's happen. And if it wasn't for you, you're not looking at it. So what is Edwin's? Edwin's is hope. Edwin's is hope and a way to achieve it. It's a six-month program that takes men and women through culinary arts and hospitality in a fine dining restaurant, just like George did for me. It's taking every man and woman who have gone through the justice system and giving them that second chance, that fair second chance. Each student gets business basics. Then they work every position in the restaurant over those next five and a half months. And afterwards, we take and place them in jobs. Most importantly, we support them. We've got their back. We've got their back. So no matter what the problem is, no matter what that trouble, we're going to be there supporting them, getting the right plan in place and putting that network together. So our family is getting bigger by the moment. You can imagine. Every student that comes in, they're one of us now, and we're doing this together. And my approach is simple. It's humans helping humans. As simple as that. If you complicate it, we're going to lose it. It's seeing someone and saying, we can help you. So from the beginning, we never ask what your, what your uh, past offense was, what your previous life was. We don't even ask that, nor do we demand a certain level of education. We look for passionate individuals who are willing and open and ready to make that change in their life. And when we find them, we don't let go. Like I said, no matter what happens, we don't surrender to fear. If someone relapses, we're going to go set up a plan, work with their family, work with their sponsor, and get them back on track. If someone gets thrown in jail, I'll visit them within the next day or two and say, hey, man, here's what's going to have to happen. You keep studying, we'll keep working, and we'll see you in a couple months. So we're not turning our backs on someone. It's not going to get done just one try. Our mission is to change the face of reentry. Change it. It's just the same thing that Martin Luther did with civil rights. We have a community of individuals that we need to cleanse and redo. And we can do that. We can do it. We're doing it tonight. We're changing perspective. The first perspective that our goal is to change is our students. Educate them to a new reality. Let them see the world a little bit differently and know that it's possible. We just change one perspective. Our diners who come in every night who say, hey, that was some great Bordeaux and some wonderful duck confit, and, and it was all done by who? So there's this disconnect that a human isn't capable of doing something because of their past. So we're educating everyone every night. And lastly, teaching in prison. So every Sunday for nine months, I'll go and teach in Grafton Prison. And not only are we opening a new reality, instilling more hope into that, those walls, we're also educating our correction officers and wardens that, hey, it's not just a number that you're looking at. You're looking at a great human being who's capable of making a souffle that they usually eat at the end of the day anyways. So we're slowly doing it. We're slowly doing it. We're not surrendering. We're pushing, and we need your help to do it. Every human being, regardless of their past, deserves a fair and equal future. They deserve a fair and equal future, and that's what we're here to do. So where's that gotten us? As Hillary said, 
a year and a half we've been open. In that year and a half, nearly $2 million in business. The profits from that offset two-thirds, over two-thirds of the cost to running the institute. We have 63 graduates, 95% are working. Zero back into prison. Zero. They've got it. So for anyone who says it's impossible, well, I've got words not for the camera for them. It's possible. It really is. So we're moving. Um, we also, we're not afraid to take chances. There's a committed team, and it's not just myself. There's a team of individuals clocking in over seven, 800 hours a week to make this work. Because when you believe that someone's no dream is too big, then you have to work the extra hours to help fulfill it. So sending students to France, to Chicago, to Boston happens, but it takes a lot of work to make that happen. So I couldn't be more thankful for the team that we have here at Edwin's. But again, taking chances, going to that next level. When we see a need, attack it and move on. Our next need we, we need to fill is housing. You'll go out and have a good dinner, but you know what? That student may be going back to their car or they may be going back to the shelter, which isn't okay. So what we announced in December is a housing project, a dorm room. And in three months, Cleveland stepped up and raised $1.2 million. So we're this much closer to making a whole dorm room setting and a new home for our students possible. And it's not gonna stop there. We will not stop a meat shop, a fish shop, build the best culinary school in the United States of America by changing perception, by changing realities. And that's how we're gonna make it happen. So, before we begin, I want to uh, congratulate first the presenters. For one, having the courage to live a purpose-driven life. Any real social entrepreneur will tell you that to do this, you've got to put your community first, your business second, and yourself third. So I congratulate you. And I also congratulate you in the crowd for packing the house on a Monday night in Cleveland, Ohio, with spring on the horizon. You could have been out getting a tan, but you weren't. You filled, <laughs> you filled the room up with hope, and that's, that says a whole lot. So with all the courage and all the hope we have in this room, there's no doubt we're going to make this happen tonight. So thank you very much and enjoy.